Hey, Cornerstone, welcome to our first ever church at home service, if you will. I, I mean, I confess, I, it, it's kind of lonely in, in here for me right now, but I, I hope you're not. Uh, I hope you're with somebody, whether that be um, somebody that maybe lives in your apartment complex, maybe that's a neighbor or a friend um, or, or, or your kid. You know, if you don't have your kids around you, uh, call them over, sit them down. And this is a great time that this is for them, too. That this is going to be just a great time to open up um, some scripture and to even to pause throughout and just have some questions um, that you guys can wrestle with as a family, you can wrestle with as a church family and, and as friends. Uh, and I think it's going to be a time that's uh, really encouraging um, for for all of us as we reflect on uh, what Scripture actually um, has, has some really clear things and some encouraging things uh, to tell us uh, during a time um, like this. Uh, we are going to continue throughout our, our break that we're taking. We are going to, in terms of gathering, we are going to continue our, our study through the book of Ephesians, um, but this week, um, I, I'm actually not going to be, I'm going to be reflecting on some things from the first three chapters, but this week, uh, we're not going to actually preach a sermon, um, though there was a lot of preparation done this week, we're not going to preach a sermon on, um, on on chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, because of what we're doing today, um, but uh, what you can do is, we're going to include a link um, uh, right there, we're going to include a link to Right Now Media, that has a, a video from an Ozark Christian College professor. Uh, his name is Michael DeFazio, and, and he's got a little 17, 20-minute clip, something like that, on this text. Um, and, and it was going to challenge a lot of things of that, that I was planning to challenge as well. And then to go with that, there is a discussion guide uh, that's right there available as well that you can, if you want to do that today or if you want to do that later on, that you can um, wrestle through that um, with others or maybe with your family uh, now, whatever works best for you as well. Um, just other things that just to kind of share with you up front is, is just some, uh, maybe some generic announcements here is, is one, just a reminder that though we're going to be doing videos like this for the next few weeks, um, that we aren't going to gather in person, um, that, that services are, are canceled. But remember, the church isn't closed. We'll talk more about that here in just a second, that we're still going to be the church and we're going to utilize the resources that we have uh, available uh, to us. Um, but upcoming, actually, still, we're still planning on Easter service, we're still planning, praying, and maybe, just maybe, that this this environment, that this uh, little hitch in the system, if you will, is going to give us even more opportunities to prepare the hearts of those that we're going to invite along for Easter. Maybe you've got the chance to invite someone into your home um, as long as everybody's healthy, you have an opportunity to invite them in to uh, maybe hear some of these challenges over the next few weeks and, and to gather with them in, in, your, in your home and with church at home. Um, that maybe this is a good way to prepare the hearts of those that you are going to invite. Um, and, and we hope um, coming Easter that you will invite three um, to come and to gather with us and have that be the start of um of their journey with us as, as Cornerstone uh, Christian Church. And then Good Friday, um, obviously on the Friday uh, before Easter. A few more things just to mention here up front before we really get into what we're going to get into. And that is, is first, um, it, it, there are aspects to worship that even though we're not getting together, we can still continue in. Um, one of those is uh, is offering. Um like, like we, we, we don't fear um, this, this virus. We don't fear um, God's provision just by not meeting together. Some have asked the question, well, how are we going to take up offerings? How are we going to keep things going? Because we've got, uh, we've got ministers and missions and facilities and all sorts of things to continue forward. Um, but, but fear not. We're not worried. We're not, we're not fearful um, that you've got opportunities through, through on, online giving, um, Still, still mail a check if you wish. There's a variety of ways to do that, and we hope that you will continue to to worship um, through giving, and that you'll still do that as we don't meet physically over these next um, few weeks. Um, and also, maybe this is going to be a different experience for you, but especially if you're gathered with others in the room, um, is is try to utilize communion um, in your morning. To try to try to utilize like maybe right now you don't have. 
um, especially with maybe a bread shortage. Maybe you don't have some bread or you don't have some juice in your home. Uh, but we hope that at the end of this service, um, at the end of this discussion, this video, that you will take some time um, to remember um, Christ's sacrifice, just to pause and to reflect that if, if you don't physically have the elements, you'll take the time still to reflect. But, but if you do have, that you would go ahead and you'd share those with the family or, or as, as a group. Um, and so here after I pray, we're going we're gonna to kind of pause for a moment. I'm going to give you a second to maybe prepare some of those things. Do you have them available? And one other way is there, there's a YouTube link that we're going to provide for you uh, for, for a music video. Um, that's an opportunity maybe for us just to worship through song, but also as a song to prepare our hearts uh, for communion, which is the way we're going to, to end, um, end our time. It's just by watching uh, watching this video and, and reflecting on the words and, and just being encouraged and to remember that there is a table that we have all been invited to through the cross of Christ. So um, I, I'm going to pray for us as we start that, um, that our president is, has uh, declared um, a today, um, Sunday, to be a, a national day of prayer. And, and certainly we want to participate in that for every day we say is a praying day. Uh, because where there is great prayer, there is great power. Um, and there is lots of prayer needed. Um, that, that this is, if nothing else, this has been a reminder um, of, of the need for, for God's provision and, and just an understanding of uh, that God really is in control and, and that uh, God really is good in these times and it's Him that we can cry out to in the midst of it. So let's just start our time here with a word of prayer. God, I just pray that right now that uh, as we're gathered in a variety of places, God, in our hearts are in all different sorts of conditions that, God, maybe some of us are, are worried and some of us are fearful. God, maybe some of us are, are frustrated. God, maybe some of us are uh, even hard-hearted uh, God, some of us are ready to receive your word. Some of us are ready to see you right now. Okay, God, there's probably a variety of different responses that we have. That God, that you would use this scenario to draw hearts to you. God, that you would remind us that you are steadfast, that you are true, and that no matter what happens around us, that you are good, that you are that you are reliable, that we know you will do what's right. God, draw our hearts to you. Draw the hearts of the people within our nation, around the world, to you in the midst of this. And God, also, I pray that uh, that you would just be with those that are uh, maybe experiencing the illness, um, to maybe on the more severe end, that you would um, work in them and through them, that you would just give us wisdom as the church as how to care for others, that you would give us wisdom and discernment as to how to um, just interact and, and just give us a right spirit in the midst of all of this, that we wouldn't get bitter, but through um, just through all of this that's taking place within um, our country right now, that we would uh, draw closer to you and that we would love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and God, that we would love our neighbor, that we would love others as ourselves. God, you are good and, and we, we can fully trust in you. God, if there's nothing else that we take uh, just during our time today, that we would know that 100% true, that we can always trust in you, even when our situation is uncertain, that you are always good, even when our circumstances are not. Help us to be the church. God, may your light shine all the brighter. As it seems, it seems that darkness prevails, but God, we know it doesn't. Because you are the resurrection of life, we can always trust in you. God, we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. I've got to confess right here up front that uh, this, whole, this whole situation has me frustrated. But there's one thing in particular that has, my, has me frustrated. And just to be honest, I... I, I kind of think there's a conspiracy um, in the midst uh, of all this. And, and here's my conspiracy. I think that the Big Ten Conference is behind this because, uh, you know, you, everybody can argue with me, but I think it's, it was pretty clear 
um, that this year that the Hawkeyes, the Iowa Hawkeyes, were going to win. They were going to sweep, um, that they were going to win men's basketball, they were going to win wrestling, and they were going to win women's basketball. They were going to take it all. It was going to be a national championship sweep. And I think that somehow, some way, that there's this conspiracy that this all took place um, uh, because, um, you know, the Big Ten couldn't handle it, but also like even the national conference, they couldn't, they couldn't handle that, that that was just too much winning for us. And, and so this whole thing just, just happened because, uh, you know, these didn't want the Hawkeyes to take it all here. No, I, I, of course, um, I, I'm just making a little light at this situation, not because it's light at all, but simply to illustrate that maybe for you, um, maybe for you, there are some things that are, are kind of lingering, really bothering you. Um, or, or, or your kids, or anybody in the room that maybe there's something that really um, has, is causing you stress or anxiety. Maybe you're not even sleeping well at night. When you get up, maybe you have a fear. Um, here, here's my question. Is there, in this whole situation with, with the virus spread and all these cancellations, these closings, what would bother you the most? Uh, like what, what are you most concerned about? Do you have some fear within you? Just take a second. Uh, and, and, and pause the video and just ask with those around you, what is it that you fear the most during this time? I think one of the best ways to deal with our fears and um, our concerns, whether they're really big or whether they're really small, that that one of the best ways to, to deal with that when it comes to being a follower of Jesus is just to, to have some perspective, just to, to take a fresh look at what, what Christ has to say, what Paul has to say, what Scripture has to say uh, about who we are in Christ and, and how this whole story of life really plays out. I think perspective is a huge key when it comes to any situation that we are in, no matter how big or how small. And so the text that I want to look at, and we'll, we'll resume with Ephesians um, uh, next week, but the text I want to look at actually comes does still come from Paul, and there's going to be real some similarities here from, from our study of Ephesians, but we're going to look at Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at quite a few uh, verses within it. Um, we're not going to get through the whole chapter, but we're going to look at some key texts here. And so, so here's the first part that I want us, want us to look at. So, so I, I'm in Romans chapter 8. Uh, verses, uh, verse 18 here, here to start. Now, here's what it says, and I'm going to kind of pause as we go through this. Here, here's, what it, here's how it starts. Yet what we suffer now, I could stop right there. Uh, the, the word suffering, um, the word now, uh, it helps us to think about right now where we're at. Um, Right now, many of us feel, whether we are or not, we feel a little bit quarantined. We feel a little bit um, out of our realm. We feel a little bit out of control. We feel a little bit, um, maybe to some degree, like we're suffering, or at least at the very least, we feel a little out of control. So this, that, that's a good, good start for us. Yet, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. We're starting with some perspective. Then he says, for all creation, that's a lot, for all creation. So everything that God has made, like going back to Genesis chapter 1, like God made everything, ex nihilo, he made everything out of nothing. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to, Subjected to God's curse. All creation. So all creation has been broken. Everything has been broken since Genesis chapter 3. Since sin entered into the world, everything is broken on a foundational level. The problems that we face, the suffering, the trials, the uncertainty, all of that is there, Paul tells us. Because of sin, and since then, the world, all creation, has been subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, Paul goes on, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward. By the way, we're included in creation. 
but with eager hope the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering, don't we? We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. You know, I know we've said this before, but uh, I mean, especially if, there, if there's kids in the room or whatever, it's not even they can see this observation and, and we together can see it that when God created the world, he said, it's good, it's good, it's good. He created man and said, it's very good. But then it take, doesn't take very long for the world to not look so good. And that was the effects of sin. And we look at the world and we go, this isn't very good, that there is, there's illness, there's virus, there's there's cancer, there's, there's evil, there's darkness. And as a result, all creation, including us, Paul reminds us there, he specifies later on, that we're all looking for the day of redemption. And we, in that moment, we have tremendous hope. We have great hope. Why? Because we're going to experience, we're going to see, we're going to get a, be a part of our full rights as adopted sons and daughters. Now let's not forget the beginning of Ephesians, what Paul used this imagery, that the clearest thing in that, there's so many big things that Paul has to say and, and hope for us and good things for us, but what he calls us is he calls us adopted sons and daughters because of our faith in Christ. And so what Paul is saying here in Romans 8 is that we face trial, we face suffering, that the world's not as it's supposed to be, that things don't look good. You know, God, God declared them good at the beginning. It's not that good anymore. That all creation longs for redemption. We long for a better day, that there is a better day coming, and we can look forward to that. That as adopted sons and daughters, the promise for us is redemption. So what's one of the best solutions for us as we face things like coronavirus? What are the best things as we face economic trouble? What's, what's the best thing to focus on? Well, it's not the treasures of this world. It's not the things of here, but we've got to have a bigger perspective, a perspective of eternity, a perspective of when all things are made new. Now, especially kids, if, if you're in the room, um, I, I want you to see this illustration because I think it will, it will help. And it's one that, uh, that we've used before. It's one that I really like to use. It's kind of a regular occurrence for me. But, but here's a good reminder for me on a regular basis. And, and I think for you, too, is that we so easily, when we experience things like coronavirus or economic downfall, or we start looking at even when things are going really, really well or they seem to be going well, is we oftentimes look at um, just kind of like what's right in front of us, like just like what's right in front of our eyes, which, which really is just like this little orange part here. Now, when we focus on just the here and now, what we're not focused on are things that last a really, really long time. It's called eternity. And that for us, whether in good times or bad, like sometimes the threat to our faith in the good times Sometimes the threat to us are the good times because what we focus on is only here and now and we forget all of the rest. But you know what the bad times do? Do you know what the times of questioning, the times of trial? They force us at times to remind us of our perspective. 
that this life that we live now is just kind of a blip on the radar. Now, I'm not saying coronavirus should cause us all to think doom and gloom and everything's, everything's going to end. That's not my point. But the trial and the difficulty and the economic downfall and, and everything that we can look at and we think, man, it just seems like things are falling apart even before coronavirus showed up on the scene, that we were still worried about the here and now and we're just focused here. But we as the church should have the most hope. We as the church should be the most uh, most optimistic, the most looking forward. And we really have a job to do to be ministers of reconciliation during this because we know that there's so much more life beyond this, that there is all of this eternity to follow. See, I think one of the best ways for us to think about fear is in perspective. I know my wife gives me some good reminders from time to time because I'll be honest I and, and as I've confessed multiple times I, I think if I've got a if I've got a significant vice these days it's it's fear because I, I can get focused on the here and now all the what ifs of this world what if my kids what if I what if what if they and I begin to lose sleep at night and my blood pressure goes up and I, I get kind of cranky and I lose perspective when I only focus on the here and now. And in those moments, my wife so eagerly will tell me, even if it's something like fear of being sick or fear of my kids being sick, but she'll so often say to me, you know what the worst case is, right? The worst case is we get to spend eternity with heaven and that's not a very bad case. I think the best solution in times of uncertainty is for us to remember that we are sons and daughters through faith in Christ. And to have perspective that we are longing for the day of redemption where we will get to experience the full rights of what it means to be a son or a daughter of the creator of the universe. So here's a question for you to ask with those that are with you, or maybe a question for you to reflect on if you're watching this by yourself. Here it is, is how does remembering that the best days, the far better days, the best days, are yet ahead in eternity? How does that impact the way that you live now? How do knowing that eternity awaits us as a, Worst case scenario, which is a great one. <laughs> For after all, Paul said to, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And how does knowing and remembering the perspective of the better days ahead of us, how does that help you live now? How does that live, cause you to live even better now? And how does having that perspective, how does that impact your fear in our study of Ephesians, uh, we were reminded in chapter one of, uh, of the fact that, that we have the hope of, of, of eternity before us and, and the, the down payment of that that God has provided us with is the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is the seal, it's the promise, it's the guarantee of our hope yet to come. And just a few verses later in Romans chapter 8, um, starting in verse 26, Paul writes this. So just verses 26 to 28 there. Here, here's what Paul writes. He says, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, just one example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's will. But then comes verse 28. Don't miss this. That was just one example, but don't miss 28. Here's what Paul writes. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And we know that God causes everything 
Like, like, just, just clarify. I always feel like I need to clarify this text. This does not mean that God causes all bad things to happen. What this means is that God will use all things. We know that God causes everything to work together. God will use all things to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now, here's what uh, Ben Witherington says. He, a great commentator. He says this, Paul probably has particularly in mind the sufferings of the present age. So when he says that God uses all things to work together for good, for those who love God and who have been called according to his purpose. He probably has in mind the sufferings of this present age. Whatever that is, that's a pretty all-inclusive list. But he goes on, he says, Paul believes that God can use such things, weaving them into his plan for a person's life, using all things to a good, uh, a good end, namely the eventual end of the redemption of believers' bodies. Here's the point. All things. God can use all things, even the bad ones, e even suffering, even difficulty. God uses all things for the good of his plan of redemption, to restore the world to him, to remind us of our perspective, to, to push us out of our comfort zones. I mean, even to think about the book of Acts and as persecution, it didn't stop the church, but it spread the church and it caused them to even be more effective. So here's what that can mean for us now is that God will use a situation that's being called a pandemic, a situation, he can use that situation for good. That we have to keep our perspective, that we have to remember the promise, the guarantee that awaits us. So here, here's a question. Is, is how might God be able to use something like the coronavirus for his redemptive purposes? How can God use this situation for good? Maybe you've already seen him do that. How have you seen that? Or, or just maybe just like looking forward, how might God use something like this for good of his redemptive purposes? And I might just tweak the question, too. That make me add a second question just a little bit differently. Is how can God use the church as part of his redemptive plan in the midst of this situation? Pause and talk about that a little bit. How can God use something like the coronavirus for good and through the church? Perspective seems awfully big to Paul. It, it seems awfully big to the scripture writers, and it's got to be big for us too. Listen to how, how Paul, he closes out this great chapter in Romans chapter 8. Here's, here's what he says, in the, starting in the second half of verse 31. He says, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? That's a pretty big statement. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? What's his point? That there's nothing bigger than God. That there is no trial bigger than God. There is no difficulty of this world that is bigger than God. We've got to keep perspective. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us? whom God has chosen for his own. No one, for God himself, has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? That's a rhetorical question, but he's going to answer anyway. Can anything ever separate us from the love of Christ? Ephesians told us, for there is, no love, there is nowhere we could look. That God's love is so big that it covers all of the earth. That nothing can separate us. There's no out of bounds 
for God's love? Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us? If Catch this. Catch this. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Look, church, that's a pretty big phrase for us. That's a pretty big perspective for us to remember, for me to remember, for kids, for you to remember. For church, for us all to remember, can anything ever separate us from the love of Christ? Like, like does it mean that he, if we're facing difficulty, does it mean God's punishing us? If we're facing trial or difficulty, does, does it mean he doesn't love us anymore? Like, catch it? No. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death or in economic trouble or facing a virus? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Paul closes up, he says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God is far bigger than any trials that we face. So fear not, church. Fear not. But remember the price that has been paid on our behalf. Remember the way to salvation through Christ Jesus. Remember that for yourself and fear not. But church, in this time, we may have canceled some gatherings just in wisdom, just in, in trying to help our community. We may have canceled gatherings, but the church is never closed, that we have opportunities right now to share that very hope, to let people know that there's nothing that God's love doesn't touch, and we can show it to others in a practical way. That we can show them what it looks like to have such a great hope and such a great confidence that we don't have anything to fear. That we are we have, we have confidence in Christ's love. That there's nothing that can separate us from that. Even a virus, even an illness, even persecution. Nothing can threaten us. Let me clarify. They can threaten us, but nothing holds any weight. That nothing has any power over us because we are assured a great a hope, a great confidence because of the price paid for us on the cross that we can look forward to the day of experiencing and seeing and grabbing a hold of our full rights as sons and daughters of the King to live as Christ. We can share, we can be and make better followers of Jesus. We can be a part of, of seeing change stories and our stories changing and impacting our community one conversation at a time. To live is Christ, but the worst the world has on us is to send us to the loving arms of God, longing for his sons and daughters to come home. So church, in this time, don't fear. Have perspective. Remember that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Remember that this world is just a blip on the radar, but that doesn't mean that there aren't great things still here for us. We've got great work yet to be done. We've got families to love. We've got neighbors to reach. We've got co-workers to impact. What's the key? Perspective. Remember the end of the story. Let's be people who live like we know the end of the book. Let's be people who live like we know the end of the story. Church, this virus has nothing on us. It may keep us from gathering. I certainly am going to miss that. Let me just be really clear. I am going to miss that over the next few weeks, and I can't wait. 
I can't wait to get together again with the church with the church family. And, and trust me, I'm going to try to sneak in little gatherings here and there, however I can to interact with people and to, to gather with my church, whether through via social media or, or whether having them to my house or, or maybe just sneaking into theirs. I don't know. I want to gather. I want to be with my church. I mean, it's a great blessing to do so, but let's not stop being the church in the meantime. Let's meet needs. Let's keep our eyes fixed on the eternal hope that we have in Christ. What I want to do is I want to pray for us once again as, as we kind of close out this portion. And I just want to encourage you to, to, to open up that, that YouTube link. Watch it. Just remember, the, remember what it means to be in Christ, the table that we are now welcome to. And to remember the sacrifice that was paid on our behalf that unites us together. And just to participate in a time of communion. Whether you're able to actually take the elements or whether you're just going to take a time as a family, as a group, to remember Christ's sacrifice and, and to pray together, to remember together, to worship in this time together. Let me pray for you. God, you are good. And yeah, we just thank you for texts like Romans 8 that just tells us that there's nothing that, there's nothing that this world has on us that can separate us from love. There's nothing. And the only thing is, would be us taking our eyes in perspective. Nothing can separate us. If the reality is not there, we may, we may get confused. We may fix our eyes somewhere else, but it doesn't change the reality that we're not outside your love. And that you have such a great plan that you can't wait. God, that as we learn from the book of Ephesians, that we are the reward. We are your reward. For your suffering, Son. God, I just pray that right now that we would just take a little time to remember that. That we get, we, we can be claimed as your sons and daughters, not because of anything we have done, but because of what you did on our behalf. May we never forget the price that was paid. God, may we minister out of the overflow of what you've done for us. And may we see the opportunities before us throughout this time and throughout the many days yet to come. God, we pray all this in your son's name. Amen.